Welcome to our online service from Knock Presbyterian Church here in Belfast. Although we are scattered every week, we gather together through this technology to learn more about the Lord Jesus and to praise him. We're glad that you've been able to join us today. And we're sure that God will bless us as together we honor and worship him. On Sunday mornings, we've been learning more about Jesus as we study one of the biographies about him, in this case, the Gospel of Mark. Today, we're going to learn about celebrating the joy of new life that Jesus brings and the need to have a new outlook to see and savor this good news about Jesus. A verse to focus our minds on these topics is found in another of the Gospels, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus speaks there about Zacchaeus, a tax collector, but they could equally apply to Levi in our reading as we'll see today. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And that's a great reason to sing his praise. As we come to worship, Isaiah 6 reminds us who we worship. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Psalm 145 reminds us what the Lord Almighty is like. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. We come to worship our good and gracious King. of acceptance from a good and gracious King Yeah. 
In our reading today, Levi and the Pharisees both come face to face with Jesus and the kingdom of God he brings. Levi, who knew himself to be a sinner, turned away from his old life to follow Christ. It was a visible expression of repentance and faith. The Pharisees, who thought they were righteous, refused to acknowledge Jesus or his kingdom, and so refused to repent or believe in him. As we come before God now to confess our sins to him inwardly, whichever of these two groups you identify with, or maybe something else in between, be honest before God and ask him to help you see your sin. Confess it and turn from it to him. Let's take some time to do that. Your grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings the song of righteousness my blood and not by merit Your grace that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation has called my heart to enter in the joy of your salvation. By grace I am redeemed by grace I am restored and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord your grace that I cannot explain, not by my earthly wisdom. The Prince of Life without a stain was traded for this sin. By grace I am redeemed by grace I am restored and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord let praise rise up and overflow my song resound forever for grace will see me welcomed home to walk beside my Savior by grace I am redeemed by grace I am restored now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. The 
reading is taken from Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 22. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came to Jesus and asked, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Oh, what a Savior, 
During the month of August, we've been encouraged to eat out, to help out. The government are offering us a discount of £10 each to help out the struggling restaurant sector. I wonder if you've taken advantage of the scheme yet, or maybe you're still a bit wary of going out. Whether you're eating or not eating, well, that was a big deal for the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Not because of a pandemic, for them, it was more a matter of their own religious regulations, which they followed out of a misplaced zeal to honor God. The problem was that what they thought pleased God actually displeased him, as Jesus showed. And in our reading today, we see two incidents about eating or not eating, feasting or fasting, where the Pharisees challenged Jesus only for him to show them that it wasn't he, but they who are in the wrong. What do these events that happened so long ago have to teach us in 2020? Well, first, we learn about celebrating the joy of new life in verses 13 to 17. If you remember back to chapter 1, verse 22, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue in Capernaum, and we read that people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. What Jesus had to teach stood out as distinctive and powerful and authentic. For this reason, people hungry for the truth sought him out. And we see the same thing happening here in verse 13. And when they gathered, Jesus began to teach them. The same thing holds today. If you're someone who's hungry for spiritual truth, then you're encouraged to seek out Jesus as you find him in the Bible and feed your soul on the scriptures. It seems that as he talked, he walked until he came to the office of Levi, verse 14, if you're following in the passage. Most people would have kept on walking. Levi was not the most pers popular person in town, and few would have wanted to be seen with him if they could avoid it. What was the problem? Levi was a tax collector, 
But it wasn't that simply people resented paying taxes. They did, of course, because those taxes were paid to the Roman Empire, which they objected to as a, a force of oppression and occupation. But it was worse than that. Those who collected tax for Rome added a huge profit for themselves, which had to be paid or else you were in big trouble and there was no right of appeal. Tax collectors in those days were regarded as greedy, thieving traitors. To many, not just the Pharisees, they were the worst kind of sinners. When Jesus stopped at the tax collector's booth, I wonder, did the crowd go silent? Were they waiting to see if he would speak to Levi and denounce him for the sinner that he was? Instead of hearing those words, words of condemnation, Jesus does something that all found amazing and some deeply shocking. He called Levi to follow him, just as he had the decent, hardworking fishermen earlier, chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. And Jesus made a mistake here. What possible use could he have for a man like Levi? What kind of message did he send about himself and his mission if he allowed Levi to be part of it, to be one of his followers? Others may have debated those questions, but Levi grabbed his opportunity without waiting to be asked twice. Just like the fishermen, he left everything and followed Jesus at once. Think of what it cost Levi to follow Christ. He left an important job, a steady source of income, and the safety of protection by the forces of Rome. Remember, he wasn't that popular. Yet he walked away from everything because following Christ meant more to him than anything he possessed. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus continues to call people to follow him today. He's maybe calling you, even as you watch this online. Some may be decent, hardworking, upstanding citizens like the fishermen. Others may have the worst of reputations and, and everybody else in between. Well, that means that whoever you are, this message is for you too. And if you're aware of the Lord Jesus calling you by the work of the Holy Spirit in your own heart and mind, calling you to follow him, then, like Levi, do not delay. Let nothing hold you back. The day Levi became a follower of Jesus was the happiest day of his life. He left his old life behind him, and he wasn't sorry. It had promised him great joy, but delivered precious little. Well, that's because then and now, all the money in the world won't meet the deepest need of our souls. We should know that, but we keep forgetting it. Those deepest needs are only met in relationship with the God for whom we were made. The joy Levi experienced overflowed, and he longed to share it with others who, like him, he knew needed to hear this good news for themselves. You see, that's just evangelism. It's telling others of the joy that Jesus has brought to you. It's nothing more complicated than that. Don't be afraid of it. And so he threw a party at his house and invited all his old cronies to meet Jesus, verse 15. However, if you're following in a passage, you'll notice that not everyone was so full of joy. Verse 16, the Pharisees are disgusted. What is Jesus doing with mixing with the like of them? How, if he's supposed to be a holy man, is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? For them, it was a case of guilt by association. To be amongst those kind of people was to make yourself as bad as they were in the eyes of the Pharisees. How sad that they completely misread the situation. Remember back to when Jesus touched the man with leprosy, chapter 1, verse 41. In those days, nobody touched lepers. Think of the precautions we're taking all the time at the moment, not shaking anyone's hands, hugging or touching the same surface as anyone else, all because we are afraid we may become infected with the coronavirus. Well, imagine that all the time, all your life, 
as someone with leprosy. To touch someone with leprosy was almost certainly to become infected and just as likely to die. And Jesus touched the man. But what happened in this case? Rather than Jesus becoming contaminated, the man became clean. The polarities are reversed. The power of God had broken into our world, changed everything, and changed this man's life. What happened there physically is happening here in this incident in chapter 2, spiritually. Jesus meets those who are social and spiritual lepers, and no one wanted to touch them, but he reaches out to heal and to help. Verse 17 puts it like a doctor bringing them life and joy. I wonder, are you aware of your own personal moral and spiritual sickness? It is there. None of us, myself included, is immune. Because sin is a universal virus, and the only known cure is the forgiveness and new life that Jesus brings in his good news. The joyless self-righteousness of the Pharisees made them fatally blind to the virus of sin they carried. They couldn't see it in themselves. They prided themselves on, on being better than everyone else, and they simply could not make sense of what Jesus was doing or why he was doing it. But it's those who see their sin most clearly who are most delighted with the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came to call and to save sinners. He doesn't wait for those sinners to improve themselves, to get in a, a better, more advantageous position, to improve their condition. Instead, like the medical staff, in the midst of a pandemic, he reaches out to the sick to bring life and joy to those who need it. But sometimes the person who is most aware of their sin feels that they should keep farthest away from Christ. Well, he wouldn't want the like of me. Not if he knew what was going on in my heart. Not if he knew what I thought or I'd done. Well, he knows. And the very opposite of what you fear is true. And he still says, come. He threw, in fact, he throws open the doors of his surgery and announces, the doctor will see you now. Like Levi, let nothing keep you from following him. So we learn first to celebrate the joy of new life, verses 13 to 17. And secondly, in order to do that, we learn the need for a new outlook, verses 18 to 22. The Pharisees, could see no joy in the feasting of Jesus with Levi, who was celebrating his new life as a follower of Christ with great joy. They seemed to be much happier with fasting. But here again, their zeal for God was misplaced. It might be worth pausing for a moment just to say a few words about fasting. The only time in the Old Testament where God commands his people to fast is annually on the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees had elevated it to an art form by fasting twice a week. You may remember that was the boast of the Pharisee as he and the tax collector went to the synagogue to pray. The Pharisee thanked God that he wasn't like other men, especially not this tax collector. And one of the things that marked him out as so special and so wonderful and so impressive in his own eyes was that he fasted twice a week. You can read that in Luke chapter 18, verse 12. For him and for the Pharisees generally, fasting had become not a source of grace, but a source of pride. They could not see it for the sin that it was. And they thus needed a whole new outlook on spiritual truth, which is what Jesus is teaching in these verses. Today, people are most likely to fast because they, they believe it's good for their health. You can find all manner of diets available uh, urging you to do this. If it's practiced in a religious context, it can be used along with prayer as a means of trying to persuade God to answer our prayer. However, if that's our motivation, it's also wide of the mark, for neither prayer nor fasting is a way of twisting God's arm to do what we want. When someone fasts or prays, or both, it is an expression of total dependence on God. It says to God, we are helpless 
without you. And just as we need food for our bodies, so we need the work of God's Spirit for our souls. It should be a mark of spiritual humility, not of pride. If you're interested in learning more of this, perhaps the most detailed book I've read on it is John Piper's book, A Hunger for God. And it's worth looking at if you want to explore it further. But let's get back to the story, which is not primarily about fasting. The question of the Pharisees in verse 18 shows again that they have not understood Jesus or what he's about. Why did the disciples of Jesus not fast? His reply to them shows how mistaken they were, verses 19 to 20. In effect, he asked them, would you expect wedding guests to act as if they were at a funeral? Weddings are a time of feasting and joy, and that's appropriate since in Jesus, the kingdom of God has arrived, as he announced in chapter 1, verse 15. And this kingdom is changing lives, as Levi had recently discovered. It is a time of joy. But because they didn't recognize who Jesus was or what he came to do, they simply had no categories in which to place him. They couldn't understand him. Remember back to last week, Mark chapter 2, verse 7. They were outraged after Jesus had declared to the paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. And the question arose in their minds, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Of course, only God could forgive sins. But what blew the categories of their minds was the fact that the possibility might be that before their very eyes, God incarnate, in human flesh, in all his divine power, was doing just that, and they couldn't accept that. But the coming of Jesus changes everything. He is not like anyone else. He does what no one else does. We, we don't have the categories in which to place him alongside everyone else because he's in a different league. The coming of Jesus changes everything. And if that seems strange to you, then don't be surprised at that. But recognize that in following Jesus, it means that we need a complete change in the way we think about how we view him and everything else in the world. Jesus uses a striking picture to drive this home in verses 21 to 22. He says, imagine someone trying to patch up an old piece of worn clothing with a new piece of cloth what will happen? At the first wash, the new piece will shrink and the tear will be made worse than before. He follows that up with a second picture from the way uh, they transported and stored wine in those days, not inside a glass bottle as we do today, but inside a, a leather bag of some sort. And over time, that would dry and crack. The new wine, perhaps still fermenting with, with life and energy, if it's poured into uh, an old uh, wineskin, will bubble and expand and crack where it is already weak, ruining, ruining both it and the wine within. And both of these pictures speak of how we cannot mix the old and the new. We cannot understand Jesus or his kingdom with mental categories that are blind to the new life that he brings and the person that he is. We need a whole new outlook to see and rejoice in the good news of Jesus. That's precisely what people often say to me when they become followers of Jesus. They recognize that the way they thought about him in the past, perhaps for years, even for decades or a lifetime, has been wrong. Now, however, the Holy Spirit who's been at work in them and in their lives brings them to a whole new outlook about Jesus and his message. They see it as good news. They see him as good news. They see life and freedom and joy, which they never imagined possible in Jesus. He is still the same today, bringing the joy of new life and changing the outlook of those who have been unable to grasp that truth before. And in the gospel, he invites you into this new life to change your heart and mind and he does it for you by the work of the Holy Spirit. He invites you to come and to find life and to find a whole way of looking at life. Will you come? Let us pray. 
loving Heavenly Father, as we come to prayer this morning, we give thanks that you are a God who loves us, a God who hears us, and a God who answers us when we pray. We come this morning as a people who need to rest in your shelter, who need to be held in your arms and protected as a parent who holds their child. Lord, we know that for many, the world is a frightening place, a place which seems full of danger and somewhere which instills fear. Lord, we ask you to free us from that fear. Let us live our lives in the light of your victory over death and darkness and forgive us for the times when the weight of the world has distorted our view of you and has limited your power. Lord, we confess that we have lived lives which at times have left little room for you and your ways. Instead of seeking your guidance, we have simply looked for you to bless our plans after we had already made them. Lord, we admit that we had our plans for how we thought this year would be. We planned trips away. We planned big events. We planned business ventures and looked at investment opportunities. We hoped for promotions and new jobs and longed for things and experiences to make life comfortable and pleasurable. And yet instead, you gently applied the brakes brought us to a halt, to a complete standstill. Through the change in circumstances, you have given us time. Time we never thought we had in the busyness of our perceived importance. Time with family and those within our own bubbles and changed our viewpoint of what mattered most. But Lord, we pray for those who have been most affected by the pandemic, those who have lost relatives and friends, those who have missed funerals and a chance to say goodbye because of the disease. We pray for those who have lost jobs or now face an uncertain future. Father, bring comfort and assurance that you love them and you care for them and that you hold them in your hands. We pray for those who have been tasked with making difficult decisions within our elected assembly. We pray for Robin Swan and Peter Weir as they make decisions about health and education and how we can safely move to a new sense of normality. We pray for wisdom and clear thinking in those decisions, free from party politics and always focused on the good of the people of this country. We also pray for our own Kirk Session and the COVID response group as they make decisions about how and when we might reopen church again in a way which is safe for those who long for a return to fellowship with one another. Again, Lord, provide wisdom as the options are debated and discussed so that you are honoured and glorified. Lord, we pray for those who have this week and next week will receive examination results. We know, Lord, that this has been an unusual year for those students and that there may be some anomalous outcomes for some. Lord, give patience and a sense of calm to those pupils who receive unexpected results. Remind them of your love and your care in each circumstance. Lord, we also pray for the families of those affected by the deadly train derailment in Aberdeenshire. Lord, bring healing to those affected by accident and bring your peace to them in what is a terrible situation. In the same way, we pray for those caught in the explosion in Beirut. Lord, we pray that you will speak into that situation and in such an awful tragedy that your will would be done. We thank you that you are an all-powerful God who responds when your people are united in prayer. We therefore, as a congregation, pray together that you hear our prayer and continue to bless us through your Spirit. We pray all these things through your Son's holy name. Amen.
So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.